Uh, my area of research is, uh, is sphincters. Uh, I study the pathophysiology and the physiology of sphincters in the GI tract. I'm interested in a number of different sphincters uh, and in how to control these sphincters. Uh, as you all know, uh, sphincter is a ring-like muscle that normally maintains constriction of a body passage or orifice mm -hmm. and that relaxes as required by normal physiologic functioning. So sphincters are smart. Uh, sphincters know uh, if uh, what's going through is uh, liquid, if it's a solid, if it's a gas, and uh, they know whether it's going forward or whether they're going whether it's going backwards. So sphincters are, are very smart. Sphincterologists, not not so much, uh, because we really don't understand the neurophysiology and the neural pathways of of what's going on with these uh, control mechanisms in these in these sphincters. And that's why I was so fascinated listening to all of this. Uh, talk about the, uh, the vagus because all of this is innervated by the vagus. So what do sphincters do? Uh, as I mentioned, sphincters are control mechanisms in the gastrointestinal tract. They control forward passage and, and prevent or allow backwards passage of solids, liquids, and gases. Uh, if you think about it, Western civilization would not exist without sphincters. <laughs> think about it. <laughs> So uh, there are a number of different sphincters in the GI tract. There's the upper esophageal sphincter, the lower esophageal sphincter, the pyloric sphincter, the ileocecal sphincter, and the anal sphincter, which is sort of what I was referring to before. And all of these, all of these mechanisms, <laughs> uh, all of these sphincters, uh, again, control, uh, control these, uh, uh, the gas, the liquid, the uh, solids that, that pass through. Technically speaking, the GI tract is actually outside the body. Now, if you think about it, and there's this, this schematic here, um, the, uh, the, there's basically the mouth and the anus, and it's all connected to sort of the, the outside. The mouth and the anus are you know, preventing things from coming out and going in. So what keeps the inside from falling out and the outside from falling in? It's, you got it, sphincters. <laughs> So why study sphincters? Uh, the fact that sphincters are responsible for many of the functional disorders in the GI tract. Um, what's the problem with these sphincters? Well, basically, you know, gastroenterologists are simple people. We, uh, we think about problems simply. Uh, so basically, the sphincter is either too tight, right, like this lady putting, putting the jeans on, or the sphincter is, is too loose. That's too loose with track, if you didn't recognize them. Uh, and how do we fix the problem? Again, you know, gastroenterologists think uh, pretty simply. So, it, you know, if it's too tight, we make it looser, right? So, like this kid. And if it's too loose, we make it tighter. And that's actually a picture by Toulouse Lautrec. So, a lady putting on a gurgle. So, uh, so uh, these these functional disorders, which uh, I believe a lot of them are caused by by sphincters. Uh, are very, very common. Uh, for, for example, uh, gastroesophageal reflux disease accounts, uh, is, is seen with a prevalence of 20 to 40 percent. It's estimated that 50 um, that percent of the population actually has uh, reflux symptoms once, once a month uh, and that 30 percent have uh, reflux symptoms uh, weekly. Uh, irritable bowel syndrome, which uh, I, I'm going to try to convince you is a uh, sphincter disorder, it occurs in about 30% of the population. About 7% of the U.S. population, nursing home population, has fecal incontinence. And, there, and we can go on and on and on. Uh, gastroparesis is probably partially a sphincter disorder. Uh, sphincter vodi dysfunction, we can, we can talk about them. So, uh, again, gastroenterologists have used sort of simple methods to, to loosen sphincters or to tighten sphincters. Here are the, some of the methods that we use to loosen sphincters. Uh, myotomy, which is actually cutting the sphincter, cutting the muscle. Dilation, which is taking a balloon or something, something hard to actually fracture the muscle. Or injection of botulinum toxin, the same stuff you use for wrinkles. Uh, injecting into the lower, like the lower esophageal sphincter for achalasia and the pylorus uh, for gastroparesis, which I've had some arguments with on some people in the room here, but I won't <laughs> mention it. Uh, and uh, the anal sphincter for functional uh, constipation and, and healing of uh, fissures. Uh, and there's uh, various methods of tightening these sphincters. We can use different medications, uh, for example, Reglan and Cisapride in, uh, in the lower esophageal sphincter for treating gastroesophageal reflux disease. 
endoscopic suturing uh, for the lower esophageal sphincter and, and incurred. Surgical repair, we can do a nice Nissen fundoplication where we wrap the stomach around the distal portion of the esophagus or a sphincterplasty in, uh, for the internal anal sphincter for fecal incontinence and the injection of bulking agents. But uh, these are relatively crude uh, because they're, they're uh, more or less permanent and you can't modify uh, the degree to which you're, you're controlling the sphincter. And so uh, uh, here comes electrical pacing in the gastrointestinal tract where you can actually modify uh, the contraction or the relaxation by modifying uh, the parameters that you're, that you're stimula stimulating the sphincter at. So the first attempts at uh, electrical stimulation in the GI tract were for uh, gastrointestinal motility occurred in the 1960s and 1970s. And most of the efforts have been directed towards uh, gastric electrical stimulation to treat gastroparesis. Gastroparesis is a disease uh, where the, uh, there's a problem with the motor function of the stomach. So the stomach isn't contracting, and there's also a problem with the resistance uh, at the pyloric sphincter, so the sphincter isn't relaxing. And so uh, th uh, there's various medications that we can use. But uh, again, gastric electrical stimulation is, uh, is one of the modes. So here's a placement of uh, pacemaker leads for, for gastric pacemakers. And, and this is also sort of crude. Essentially what we're doing is placing two electrical leads in the, uh, in the stomach, two or more, uh, and pacing the stomach. We can pay, pace it in an antegrade manner or a retrograde manner. If we pace it in an antegrade uh, manner, we can uh, treat uh, gastroparesis, the idea being we're pushing pushing the food down. We treat it in a retrograde manner. It's been used to treat obesity. Uh, it's been uh, not as effective as gastroparesis, but still an interesting idea. So uh, we propose the use of electrical pacemakers to control the tone within various sphincters to treat various gastrointestinal disorders. Uh, now, what I'm going to talk about is, uh, is some of our research. I've, I've used two examples. One is the is gastroesophageal reflux disease than the lower esophageal sphincter, and the other is uh, irritable bowel syndrome and the ileocecal sphincter. So uh, to start with, uh, we've isolated the, the various components of the lower esophageal sphincter mechanism, and it's not just one, it happens to be four different muscles. Uh, we've discovered a number of underlying abnormalities causing gastroesophageal reflux disease, and we've targeted these abnormalities to uh, treat gastroesophageal reflux disease. So uh, these studies uh, sort of go under the, the rubric of uh, physiology and pathophysiology of the high pressure zone, anti-reflux barrier in the distal esophagus. Let me first talk about the components of the high pressure zone uh, anti-reflux barrier. So there are uh, four muscles, three components. The first muscle is uh, actually skeletal muscle, and that's the curled diaphragm. The curled diaphragm wraps around the distal portion of the esophagus. It sort of acts like a, a pinch cock, uh, and it's, uh, it's uh, not directly connected to the respiratory diaphragm, so it acts in and of itself. The second is the lower esophageal circular muscle, which most of us know as the lower esophageal sphincter. That's a circular muscle, physiologic circular muscle in the distal portion of the esophagus that acts as an re anti-reflux barrier. And the third component and two muscles are the uh, sling fiber and class fiber complex, which are actually not in the esophagus, they're in the cardia of the stomach. Uh, and again, they act as, uh, as a, a sling, uh, like a bolero uh, tie, uh, uh, where the sling fibers uh, uh, force in this direction and the class fibers pull, pull them together. So we were interested in uh, isolating these various components, which hadn't, hadn't been done before, isolating them both physiologically and uh, anatomically to, to determine uh, uh, what the relationship to each other was and uh, what happens when, when one of these are defective. So we, uh, um, we took a number of healthy uh, volunteers. We used uh, a technique that we developed, uh, simultaneous high-resolution manometry. I'm sorry, simultaneous high-resolution ultrasound and co-localized with manometry. And we put, that's this uh, assembly here. Do, is there a, yeah, yeah. That's this assembly. And we put this assembly into the uh, stomach. Uh, and uh, we uh, pulled the assembly across the high-pressure zone at a, a constant velocity. 
collecting the manometry data, which is uh, over here, and ultrasound images, which are over here simultaneously. And we did this uh, in breath holding during full inspiration, full expiration, and then repeated the pull-throughs after atropine. So here you can see uh, on this three-dimensional reconstruction of the ultrasound images, the curl diaphragm outside the wall of the esophagus. Um, so what, what the idea was to, uh, uh, was to separate the tonic uh, uh, sphincters uh, physiologically. So the, uh, the idea here is that the total pressure uh, generated in the high pressure zone is equal to the uh, intrinsic smooth muscle pressure plus the extrinsic skeletal muscle pressure. And the uh, smooth muscle pressure uh, is equal to, is, is muscarinic. So that's the muscarinic pressure. And the skeletal muscle pressure is non-muscarinic. So the total pressure is equal to the muscarinic pressure plus the non-muscarinic pressure. And the non-muscarinic pressure is, uh, is equal to the pressure after we give atropine. Uh, therefore, the muscarinic pressure, or the smooth muscle pressure, is equal to the pre-atropine pressure minus the post-atropine pressure after referencing to the curl diaphragm, which we could see on, on the ultrasound images. So uh, after having said all of that, let me show you the graphs that we, that we got out of this. Uh, first, there's this red curve. Uh, the, the top graph, by the way, is, is full inspiration. The bottom graph is full expiration. These are all uh, these are ensemble average graphs. So each one of these graphs is 15 uh, patients. You can see on the uh, uh, left axis pressure, on the uh, uh, bottom axis is position relative to the curl diaphragm. And you can see where the curl diaphragm is. It says Chris on the, uh, on the graph here. And this is the beginning of the curl diaphragm. So the red curve represents the pull through before atropine. So that's the total pressure. That's the muscarinic plus the non-muscarinic pressure. The green curve represents the pull through after atropine. So that's the uh, skeletal muscle pressure, the non-muscarinic uh, non pressure. And the blue curve represents the subtraction of the red curve minus the green curve. So that's the muscarinic pressure. And you can see in each one of these graphs that there's uh, two, two humps on the blue curve. One is uh, a proximal uh, peak. Uh, and that proximal peak represents the, what we're calling the lower esophageal circular muscle, or what's mo more commonly known as the lower esophageal sphincter. And the distal peak uh, represents the uh, uh, pressure from the clasp and sling fiber complex. Now we did that same study in patients with gastroesophageal reflux disease. So the top graph here are patients with gastroesophageal reflux disease. The bottom graph is the graph that you've just looked at. And they're lined up according to the beginning of the curl diaphragm. So uh, if you look here, uh, Again, having lined up to, according to the curl diaphragm, the top peak, which represents the lower esophageal circular muscle, is in exactly the same position, although lower, uh, uh, less magnitude, is in exactly the same uh, position as, as in the normal volunteers. However, you, you'll notice that uh, there's a dramatic difference in these two graphs, and it's actually uh, that the bottom peak in the GERD patients is, is missing. It's completely absent. So, uh, so what we did in these studies was we isolated all of the components of the high pressure zone uh, and found that in, in gastroesophageal reflux disease patients, they're, they're actually missing the pressure profile, although the muscle is there, they're actually missing the pressure profile from the uh, sling fiber class fiber complex. Um, so where does this fit in with uh, electrical stimulation? So uh, you can actually, put a, a, uh, an electrical pacemaker onto the sling class fiber complex or onto the lower esophageal circular muscle in the esophagus and stimulate the, uh, uh, the muscle. And this has actually just been published, uh, not by me, but uh, uh, by this group, uh, uh, in this article, Electrical Stimulation Therapy for GERD, and uh, it, they showed that there's a significant and sustained improvement in GERD symptoms, esophageal pH, and reduction of uh, proton pump inhibitors usage without uh, any side effects uh, stimulating this area. And there was uh, another, because this is, uh, we're talking about electrical stimulation and, and magnets are sort of 
electrical. So uh, there was this recent uh, publication in New England Journal of Medicine, which showed augmentation with a magnetic device, uh, decreased exposure to esophageal acid, reflux symptoms improved, and a decreased use in proton pump inhibitors. So this is this magnetic device. You can see uh, it's a bunch of magnets tied together, which is surgically placed around the, uh, the distal esophagus. The second example I'd like to talk about is, is uh, the ileocecal sphincter. And uh, um, so the ileocecal sphincter is involved in preventing reflux of uh, colonic contents into the small intestine. Uh, as you all know, the, the uh, ileocecal sphincter is between the terminal ileum and the, uh, and the colon, the, um, the cecum. So um, we discovered that a, a defective ileocecal sphincter can lead to small bowel bacterial overgrowth and symptoms uh, consistent with irritable bowel syndrome. And we're currently working on uh, methods including electrical stimulation of the sphincter to, to uh, treat, uh, treat this. So uh, let me show you the, the studies that we did. Uh, the aim of the study was to explore whether patients with a defective ileocecal valve uh, cecal distension reflex have small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. So when you, when you distend the uh, colon with air, there's a normal reflex that causes contraction of the ileocecal valve. Uh, and uh, it's never actually been measured in, in people uh, during, without, without uh, having opened them up and, and actually putting transducers into the area. So uh, we figured out a way of, uh, of measuring that, that reflex. So uh, we used a colonoscope during uh, screening colonoscopy. A uh, manometry catheter with four pressure ports was uh, placed through the biopsy channel of the colonoscope. The catheter was placed across the ileocecal valve so that there was at least one port in the terminal ileum, one port in the ileocecal valve, and one port in the cecum so we could measure continuously. Uh, and then we were able to insufflate air, which is normally done during a colonoscopy, into the cecum with that, with that uh, pressure transducer across the ileocecal valve. So here's the uh, ileocecal valve. This is uh, the valve, this is the cecum, this is the uh, ileum, terminal ileum. This is sort of what it looks like endoscopically. And uh, this is our scope and our pressure transducer placed across the ileocecal valve. Uh, and so we, we did that, and then we did a lacteal breath test uh, one month after doing the colonoscopy. A lacteal breath test is a test uh, to look for bacterial overgrowth. So uh, the lacteal is, is metabolized by the bacteria in the small intestine, and you get an abnormal peak in, in the breath hydrogen uh, and methane. So the results of the breath tests were compared with the results of the pressures within the ileocecal valve during air insufflation. And here you can see this is a normal response in a, in a normal patient. And you can see this is, the, this is the transducer that's in the ileocecal valve. You can see it go up nicely as the other transducers remain relatively low. And here's an abnormal response. Uh, they all go up a little bit, but uh, the, the ileocecal valve is not going up any more than any of the other pressure ports. So essentially, uh, the abnormal response is, is demonstrating a common cavity between the cecum, the terminal ileum, and the ileocecal valve, where the normal response, you get this increase in pressure during air insufflation. Uh, and we found that the uh, uh, average peak ileocecal valve pressure during air insufflation into the cecum in patients uh, in subjects with normal lactulose breath tests was significantly higher than in subjects with abnormal breath tests. And that was uh, significant at uh, P of 0 0.001. So it was uh, 49 in uh, uh, plus or minus 8 in uh, normals and 16 uh, plus or minus 2 in, in the uh, abnormal group. And here you can see, uh, we just plotted out the area under the, the pressure curve, and you can see the, the difference. The normal subjects are the squares, and the, uh, abnormal, the patients with small bowel bacterial overgrowth are the, the ones in circles. So uh, compared to normal subjects, subjects with a positive lacteal breath test have a, a defective ileocecal valve cecal distension reflex, and uh, we believe that uh, patients with with a lot of patients, not all patients, but a lot of patients with irritable bowel syndrome have symptoms due to reflux of fecal uh, contents across an incompetent ileocecal valve with bacterial colonization of the, of the small intestine. 
So, um, and interestingly enough, if you treat these uh, patients with uh, non-absorbable antibiotics, they will get better for a short period of time. On, uh, when you stop the antibiotics, the, uh, uh, because you haven't done anything to the ileocecal valve, they will continue to reflux fecal contents into the small intestine and recolonize, and, and their symptoms will come back. Uh, so, we, uh, once again, uh, we propose using a pacemaker at the ileocecal valve to restore the competence of the ileocecal valve and prevent reflux of colonic contents into the small intestine to prevent small bowel bacterial overgrowth. And uh, uh, to my surprise, it's actually uh, been done in an animal model, uh, not for this purpose, but uh, for, um, uh, for purposes of a urinary conduit in the, uh, in the uh, ileum. So, uh, this is an article that was published in 1993, stimulated pressure response of the ileus uh, colonic junctional zone uh, and its use as a continent mechanism for uh, in canine uh, model. And they actually uh, electrically stimulated the small mesenteric vessels to the ileocecal valve in increasing the pressure. So, uh, so uh, sort of proof of concept, you can, actually, you can actually do this stuff. So in summary, uh, GI functional disorders are uh, some of the most common disorders worldwide. Many of these diseases are due to dysfunction of uh, gastrointestinal sphincters. And we've discovered that many of the underlying causes of functional GI disorders involve dysfunction of, of various sphincters. Uh, we have or are in the process of developing novel and innovative therapies to treat GI disorders targeting sphincteric mechanisms including uh, gastroesophageal reflux disease, irritable bowel syndrome, non, uh, non cardiac chest pain, gastroparesis, and fecal incontinence. Uh, and many of these dysfunctions can be targeted for therapy using devices that deliver electric current to the muscle or to the nerves innervating the muscle. And I'd like to uh, uh, recognize and thank uh, Anil Vagesna, who runs my lab and has uh, done a huge amount of, of work. Um, and I'm uh, open for questions. <laughs>